you know, I think architects need to talk about business and business plans and all that mm. boring stuff, but it's the most important stuff. It's the kind of, you know, the essential business backbone that allows you to do creative work. Business of Architecture UK, episode four. Hello and welcome Architect Nation. This is the podcast for architects where you'll discover tips, strategies and secrets for running an impactful and profitable design practice. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence. Make work easy with Core. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.co.uk forward slash demo. Today, I'm speaking with the fantastic Carl Turner of Carl Turner Architects, and in this conversation, it's really filled with amazing insights from Carl's business lessons as how he's explored this intersection between running a great and successful business and maintaining high levels of you know, innovative design. Um, on this episode, you'll discover how Carl started his practice how he designed his own award-winning house and leveraged that effort to get maximum exposure and prominence through the media, and how he uses the concept of optimizing profit instead of maximizing profit to partner with development entities to create projects that revitalize underused areas of London. So I hope you enjoy this episode. I'm here with Carl Turner. Hi, Carl. Hi, how are you doing? Very well. Who is the founder of Carl Turner Architects? And Carl is got, wears a number of hats. You're an architect, you're a developer, you're a, create, uh, a curator, mm-hmm. and a maker. And you've worked on a diverse range of projects from shipping containers in Hackney City Farm to the Arts Academy, which is a 10,000 square meter plus project in Peckham. Yeah. You won the Mansa Medal for the, your own personal house. The yes, that's house, right, yeah. 2013. Um, you were involved in Pop Brixton um, when you were kind of collaborating with, with Makeshift. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's an absolute pleasure to be talking with you. Lots of people I've interviewed so far have been like, go and talk to Carl. Carl's got some real wisdom on the subject of running a, running a business and actually being involved in lots of the entrepreneurial aspects of, of architecture. So I hope I, sp- I don't disappoint. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll start by asking the question, like, what, what is the business of architecture? What is it for you? Um, and what makes a successful what what makes running a successful practice? Um, I think you know business is is a really crucial part of what we do as architects, and I think way too many architects um, just don't take that seriously. Really, I mean, yeah. you know, I use the analogy of if I if I wanted to open a restaurant, I'd have to have some money. I'd have to take a lease on a place for a few years. I have to buy equipment. I have to mm. train staff. I'd have to kind of market test. So many architects, myself included, we kind of, somebody says, oh, I've got, you know, I want a kitchen extension or something. And the next thing you set a practice up and <laughs> you just kind of think, well, I've got a couple of jobs, then, you know, just, just get stuck in. But actually, you know, you should have a business plan and mm. you should have all of that stuff in place. And I think it's about really thinking about, you know, architects need to st- take a step back it's not, it's not a divine right for everybody to kind of run their own practice. Mm. And, you know, I think we all should really think about what it is we're trying to do as architects and where where architects sit within the kind of, you know, that whole kind of development, construction kind of world. And the money and business is really, really important because mm. I guess maybe we're still lagging in, in the UK, that, that kind of gentleman's profession yeah. is still lingering in the background of you know, fairly well-to-do people, you know, kind of tumbling into architecture. But, you know, it's development and and the production of space. It's a kind of ruthless business now. And you really have to be able to engage with that world and talk the language of business in order to survive in it, I think. And I think, you know, way too many architects are, are very naive and we don't talk to each other, we don't share information. So I think all of those things are really connected and you know i think architects are you know right, rightly should focus on design that's what that's our primary business mm. but the business of architecture is really important as well and that that means you have to understand the world that you operate in so how did you how did you get started running a practice was it always like a, a vision of yours to start a practice or did you win those kind of you have a, a sort of a couple of clients and then it kind of happened 
through osmosis kind of organically or i don't i don't think i had a real vision um i i graduated from the royal college and uh a couple of people I graduated with, we we kind of all talked about, you know, maybe not going back to work for practices mm. again. I had, I'd worked, taken quite a few years out between um, part one and part two. And I guess I just wanted some self-autonomy. And um, so I was quite happy working on small projects. So I, I kind of just fell into a few small projects. I did a, did a research course at the Royal College, stayed on for a couple of years part time. Mm. So that... That allowed me to be, um, uh, you know, quite choosy about what I did. Um, also, importantly, I had a wife who had a proper job <laughs> who could pay the bills. <laughs> so, uh, very, very important not to have a, a two-architect family where neither of you were earning any money. So, yeah, I, I think it's, um, again, I, I didn't have a proper plan really. Mm. And uh, Probably in hindsight, it was a big mistake. I should have gone and worked for some more practices whose work yeah. I admired, got some better experience of the kind of buildings that I wanted to do. I kind of raced into it. No, nobody advised me against it, which uh, might, might have been good if I'd had a sh- <laughs> sort of shoulder to lean on. And somebody had said, maybe not such a good idea to dash straight out of college. But I was really keen to make things. So that was where the whole kind of making thing came from. I think... I've described it as plinth envy from the Royal College where, you know, surrounded by people making jewellery and chairs and products and, you know, I, you know, people used to stroll through the architecture end of year shows and kind of look bemused and then go and coo over the, the kind of amazing stuff that um, the Royal College is known for. Yeah. So I, can, I think, you know, myself and some of my compatriots, we had a sort of desire to just get out and actually make stuff. So... Actually, my first commissions were really building furniture mm. for people and built some furniture and then eventually I built an extension to put the furniture in and becoming a builder was a sort of natural progression for me and it, it was a way of building up experience really quickly. Actually, people were really suspicious about an, a, a, a sort of architect without much experience, but mm. actually, as long as you were cheap, they didn't really care if you had any experience building furniture. Yeah. Um, so yeah, you know, it was, it was a kind of, um, just trying to work through those, uh, you know, I mean, I guess I was just trying to keep, keep some money coming in and I was just jumping from job to job. I didn't Mm. really have a plan. And I think that's true of so many, uh, young architects desperate to kind of, uh, do their own thing and, um, you know, but it's quite it's quite amazing when you look at the sort of statistics. About fifty percent of qualified architects work for themselves in some in some fashion, which is a kind of huge amount of mm. people. And perhaps there's there's not much preparation for that. As through, you know, we go for a very right. a very long training, mm. and most of the architects I speak to, pretty much, I can't think of one who's actually had a very strategic plan mm. and have thought it all out. It's more like actually, you know, what I left university, did part three, and I was like, I was I was hungry. Yeah. I wanted to design something, mm. and then we kind of just jump out into it, and then yeah. either architects get trapped in that cycle of doing projects that perhaps they don't want to be doing, mm. and they're not delivering on that kind of you know the impactful design practice that they've always dreamed of. Yeah. Or somehow they do manage to do it, but they can never quite understand what happened or, or mm. how to do it. Yeah, there's always an element of luck of being in the right place at mm. the right time. But I do, I do believe that you make your own luck. And, yeah. You know, I think throughout my career, I've I've tried to make things happen. Mm. Not you know, in terms of really meaningful projects, but also if people don't believe in you, then you know, quite often I've acted as a client myself, effectively, and I've. Mm pushed a, a project forward um but yeah you know it's it's not it's not always an easy transition and i think there isn't a lot of support for young architects and you know it's easy to get stuck in a in a big practice um maybe not being fulfilled in what you're doing but i mean i think there's a lot there's a huge range of really good practices around in the uk now i think there's a lot more choice and probably i wouldn't have been so desperate to <laughs> work for myself but I felt probably, you know, a few years ago when I qualified, um, there just wasn't that much choice of yeah. practice around or practices. There were lots of really great European practices, but not yeah. so many in the UK. So, uh, you know, it's frustration of, you know, really not feeling that it's probably only one or two practices that I wanted to work with. And, um, but actually I just, you know, wanted to get, get, get on and do my own thing really. 
And so can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects where you took over as being the client and what kind of, what kind of initiated those projects and how they mm. turned out and how they've kind of expanded your view of running a practice? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I, I bought my own, I bought my first flat when I was 21 with my wife back in the 100% mortgage days. Nice. So, uh, you know, I've always, I guess, I'm a serial renovator. I've nearly always got a project on the go in the background, yeah. which is... You know, as soon as I finish somewhere, I move straight away usually because um, the project is the kind of thing for me rather than the end product. Mm-hmm. So I've nearly got, so that's kind of how I started, you know, sort of started small. It's another RCA product design adage, fail early, fail cheap. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, experiment at a small scale and then it will stand you in good stead as you move on. Yeah. So, Well, that, that's like a really powerful model actually is yeah kind of actually just thinking about you know we kind of need to get out there and make the mistakes exactly and if you can yeah. do it as mitigate it and do it with small small steps it's yeah so you know design furniture design interiors mm. then move on to small extensions and buildings and gradually you know you kind of move through so i think that you do need to build up a sort of confidence in your own skills as well um and you know i really believe in hands-on you know i think there is a a big uh, bit of a missing gap at the moment with young architects who just don't have those kind of hands-on skills to actually deliver projects mm. and they're living in a digital world and you know the building site still isn't that digital it's <laughs> quite you know <laughs> bricks and mortar yeah yeah so uh, but some of the breakthrough projects were well, probably my own house really um, so that was a combination of probably 10 years of doing lots of houses and flat refurbs and then I did a big barn in Norfolk that yeah. I kind of was you know elements of new build but really I got got lucky and bought a really rundown terraced house in Brixton that had a long garden with mm. a with a tumble down garage at the end of the garden so I bought a house that I didn't want to get a plot of land to maybe have that dream of building a house and um you know we've stretched ourselves to the limit financially and uh you know I, I was almost shocked when I got planning for this house because I you know I put in a a, I guess it was a vision of a new type of terraced house this kind of three-story glass and steel house Um, because I I think I'm always thinking about narratives and what does it what does a project mean to Mm. me what does a project mean to the practice what where does this fit in the pantheon of new houses you know if I'm going to spend two or three years of my life delivering a project like that it's got to be something more than just kind of, you know, just, just a nice house. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I'm, I guess those projects where you've got total control over them, it's really good to really, you know, think about it in a very fundamental way um, and, and think about how you can really get the most from it for yourself or, you know, for, for the design world. Mm. Um, so I think delivering that project was a sort of real key project for me that I went on to win the, the Mansa medal. It yeah. was on Grand Designs, a big yeah. TV program. And so I think that got me noticed. Yeah. And that was... Um, was that was that something that you kind of consciously went about, like engaging with the media to sort of tell the story of this, of this house? And definitely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously, first and foremost, we were building a house for ourselves. Yeah. We, we did actually think that one was going to be a keeper. We'd built it with the intention of living there forever, whatever yeah. that meant. And, um, you know, but yeah, we, that that kind of narrative about a, a, a low energy house, it's a code mm. five house, one of the lowest energy houses built in the UK. And um, it's it's kind of, it's you can split it into two flats. It's got a big roof garden or a sky garden, as we called it. Lots, lots of innovative features, um, energy piles, so pile uh, kind of um, uh, kind of loops that go down into the ground, work yeah. with an air source heat pump, so we're actually extracting energy from below the ground. So it had lots of really innovative stuff going on um, that was above and beyond what we needed to do in a house like that, but it was all part of pushing ourselves as a practice, using yeah. it as a research vehicle mm. to really learn about low energy houses um, and what that meant. So things like Grand Designs, I approached them and, you know, I think the way I saw that was um, even if it went slightly wrong and it was kind of comical, at least I'd be that guy from Grand Designs <laughs> as opposed to the guy that you'd probably never heard of otherwise. So, yeah. And I think it did really put the practice on the map mm. and it got me recognized. So now if I go networking with other architects or, or 
people always think, oh, I've met you before, and I usually end up saying I was on Grand, Grand Designs, yeah. and they go, oh, God, yeah, that's where it was. So I think it was really great for just getting me out there generally, mm. but not just you know, not just with other architects, just, just generally. What actually happened was then we got just two years being inundated with people with really awkward, impossible to build on sites that they wanted like slip houses building on and but they didn't have any money or yeah. hardly had any money and you know it was so i think that's the problem is that as soon as you get known for something you immediately get pigeonholed and i guess that happens in all industries yeah. not, not just architecture but you know this was a, a stepping stone project for us and but i used it as a you know i had my office in the ground floor there for a couple of years and anybody that i could think of i invited to the house to come and see it i had events and do's there it was an open house um so i really you know i really used it as a massive vehicle for talking about architecture yeah. and engaging a wide range of people and why you did know, you sell it um start asking well <laughs> i mean pop brixton was the real the real catalyst to sell it so that right, was this okay. kind of uh my next kind of development um uh, foray really which so yeah, probably like a lot of architects, um, we ended up living in a, a, a lovely home, mm. but we had a massive mortgage. Mm. Our dream was to be mortgage free and it yeah. cost a lot more to build than we thought. And um, so yeah, in the end we had a, a house that was worth an awful lot more money than we ever thought it would be. Yeah. And, um, and a big mortgage didn't have much work coming in still. And it had a few people, you know, I think we were about four or five people at the time. So, uh, yeah, this opportunity came up in Brixton around the corner, which was um, a local council yeah. um, uh, sort of expression of interest, really. Not not for architects, but just for anybody. Right. They had a piece of land and they wanted people to come forward uh, with ideas about how to use this piece of land. Um, they were interested in creating jobs and training and, and really using it as a test bed to see what type of workspace would, would work or what was needed in the centre of Brixton in the future. And uh, unfortunately, they didn't have any budget for it. So they wanted people to basically come forward, fund it, deliver it, and then run it. So it's because long story short, I won the competition and uh, with kind of after a bit of air pumping, thinking, <laughs> wow, this is amazing. Suddenly the penny dropping that actually this is probably going to cost, you know, half a million, million quid to build. We didn't really know at the time. Yeah. And um, so that was the catalyst for selling the house. I actually had to show the council that I had the money in the bank right, in order okay. to, before they'd signed the lease with me. And uh, I then uh, met a guy called Reza Merchant from... So, so did you, do, um, you actually bought the site then? Often? No, we leased it. You leased it. Yeah, often. so they gave us... So it's an interim project. Um, and originally it was a two-year lease. Right, uh, okay. But extended to three and now yeah. it's five years. So quite a really risky project because, you know, it me needed some big investment, a lot mm. of energy to get it off the ground. And but effectively... It, it all had to kind of wash its own face, so to speak, within three years. Yeah. So that's that's quite a tough call to, you know, build a, a you know a, a you know a sort of major site in the centre of a town centre, deliver it really quickly, yeah. get it fully trading and operating, and then close it down after three years and get all of your money back and hopefully make a profit. So, yeah, kind of possibly a bit foolhardy, but um, you know, so. The idea really was a sort of social enterprise mentality, mm. which was really about trying to create something that was what we've talked about as optimized profit rather than maximized profit. So we we're trying to create a vehicle that creates some profit for us. Yeah, actually, it's about creating a sort of socially equitable space in Brixton. So charging some businesses more so that other businesses can pay less. Mm. Trying to curate a really great sort of offer. Yeah, and so it's got everything from you know barbers to a record store to lots of food businesses, lots of workspaces. But it's also got things like Bounce Back, who um, so they're, they're based in Brixton Prison, and this is the first space they've had outside the prison. And they uh, so they work with day release prisoners who've been yeah. trained in painting and decorating in the prison. Then they come down to Pop, and they use that as a sort of uh, I guess a sort of um, a hub back in the community. So it's about reintegrating back out of 
prison into society and they yeah. go off and do painting and decorating jobs and they go back to the prison in the evening Amazing. so there's loads of other organizations like that apart we've got um represent radio who came out of peckham and they they train about 400 kids a year in mm. radio skills but really that's about teaching <clears throat> youngsters to be self-confident and teach them how to write a cv and do all of that stuff and about gradually exposing them to the world of work um making them realize that you know there is a reason to study hard yeah because there's lots of good stuff going on you can get involved with so you know that it's a real it's a real platform for local people that's the way we see it um but behind it there's a business so mm. i wrote a business plan <clears throat> worked out what i thought it would cost to build what it would cost to run um what we thought we might you know the income that we get obviously i was hope hopelessly wrong uh the model's correct but uh you know got the figures horribly wrong yeah uh, obviously i'm an eternal optimist so i was over optimistic on every count um but you know it's successful we're getting um on average sort of 15 to twenty thousand people a week so it's about a million people a year wow. visiting pop brixton and that has a huge knock on an impetus on the local economy so you know we're really proud of it it's a really yeah and it's kind of um, that architectural holistic thinking that's been applied to this and there's a real exactly. sort of civic sense of responsibility in the whole yeah. development we're really trying to think about a new form of bottom-up development mm. um which which kind of pulls people along with it rather than kind of excludes local people it's really created targeted at local people so yeah. about 70 percent of the space is um, occupied by people from Lambeth and there's an ac application process that preferences local people yeah so it's really about you know finding that local talent and then providing that platform but what we're trying to provide is a sort of um, a pipeline of space so we're trying to encourage um, I guess space not somebody not to see a cheap space and then think they grab it forever mm. it, which is kind of what tends to happen I think it's about saying, well, look, you take the cheap space while you need it for six months or a year or 18 months. Mm. And then when you're a bit more, you know, secure in your business, then move on to the next space and let somebody else have that take one. So, over, yeah. so that, that's the mentality is it's about providing a, a sort of, you know, a, a constantly sort of fluctuating uh, people through the space. Um, and how did you so you, you kind of used your own finance to be able to take the lease on how else yeah. was there any other finance that you needed you had the relationship with makeshift how did, how was that working yeah so I uh, I spoke to quite a few developers because again you know I was trying to use this so once we got a few containers on site you know I invited lots of people with a view to investing maybe but also yeah. to chat about maybe pitching to the council about what the mm. long-term future of the site would be so i was trying to sell you know sell my own services effectively yeah. use this you know that thing about always knocking on people's door asking for something well mm. i was saying well look i've got something here that is like you know i was trying to invite somebody to the party basically there's going to be a price to come yeah. to the party yeah. obviously <laughs> but um so yeah i met this guy called reza and then we we set up an organization called makeshift um and uh so he invested eff effectively most of the money into the project um and yeah so we went on to set up makeshift as a sort of social enterprise with uh the idea of kind of replicating the model of pop brixton not mm. necessarily with shipping containers um but yeah about providing um you know this kind of op optimized affordable creative workspace um targeting local people yeah. and trying to provide real opportunities for people um and uh, you know but op probably starting off with interim sites as they're called so sort of short-term sites but you know eventually the the idea is the goal is that this will become a long you know these these could be uh you know very low-tech buildings as well so i guess it's that question about whether you could easily spend 50 million on that site and create a building that nobody local could ever afford to yeah you know go into mm. or you know like we spent probably about a million and a half in the end um and you know we've created two three hundred jobs something like that um about 70 businesses on site <clears throat> yeah tens of thousands of people a month kind of visiting so you know it's kind of but somehow we haven't created architecture we've created a sort of temporary space you know it's got a lifespan and uh but you know we're, i think these are these are kind of exemplar projects so they're like test beds really to mm. test what can work on a site mm. so 
we really hope the Lambeth Council sort of take it on board and from what it. we've done there. Yeah. You know, that that was their ambition was to bring some of that stuff through into the final proposal. Um, but yeah, we've we've won an, another competition uh, this time in Southwark in Peckham, and it's uh, so that's as ma- as a makeshift team. Um, so yeah, it's a conversion of this huge. It's quite a famous car park with Frank's Bar on the roof and yeah. Bowl Tennessee's Arts Organisation. So yeah, they they're going to stay there, and we're taking up what what the local people call the empty levels. So hence we called our project Peckham Levels. Um, so that's on site now. It's, it's launching around about Christmas this year. So mm. it's about eighty thousand square feet of creative workspace. We've got kind of dance studios performance spaces um a bit a bit of food and drink mm. some event spaces but we've got maker spaces as well yeah. um yeah I, th- I think we've got 50 studios about around about 120 square feet and we've got over 500 people have been on the waiting list for them so we've Amazing. really sort of you know f- in all of these areas that are maybe seen as kind of being a bit challenge you know a bit challenged maybe they haven't haven't always had a very good local economy but mm. there's a huge pool of people that are just excluded because they haven't got affordable space to yeah. to be creative with so um i think there's a lot of talk about affordable housing but we really need affordable creative workspace yeah. as well there's a it's kind of like the, the the first part of the puzzle really isn't <clears throat> exactly. it exactly it's like the kind yeah. of conscious development yeah and we're actually kind of starting to look at you know a viable economic way of revitalizing uh, these sort of urban gap sites that are kind of yep. lost and sort of neglected. Exactly. So yeah, that, that's our, that's our next one, and then we're we're doing another project together. Um, myself and Makeshift, where I'm much more of the architect on this mm. one. Makeshift are really the client, but we we've again won a, a site on the edge of the Olympic Park called Clonico Key, just in front of the Copper Box, overlooking Hackney Wick. And in a way, that site, we're going to use kind of much more sort of barn structures and uh, timber frame buildings. So we're sort of moving slightly away from containers. But yeah. again, in, in a way, we're sort of reproviding space that I guess has been lost gradually on the Hackney Wick site and trying to somehow blend the Olympic Park and Hackney Wick together. So there's a kind of, it's a very much an interim or, uh, you know, sort of intermediate space between those two very different worlds. Yeah. And we're trying to create a sort of, space that sort of straddles both of those two worlds really so that's uh we've just gone through feasibility and we're just going into planning before christmas so that's that'll be our third project amazing and so yeah those those are projects so so i'm actually a director of makeshift um well i'm probably going to step down fairly soon because we're busy now as a design practice so and is that still the kind of where you want to put all your focus on is still running the design practice rather than or well, it's, they it's, work well together, sort of hand in hand. Yeah, hand hand in hand, and I guess creating almost helping to set up your own organisation as a client then feeds the practice with work. So that was my ambition. Really, was obviously I was hoping to make a little bit of money from some of these yeah. projects because it's tough running a design practice these days. But more importantly, to create that what we've always called a pipeline of work. So mm. you know, we're almost. Create, you know, creating our own client body that will then feed the practice with work. Yeah. But you know, as as makeshift's grown way bigger than we thought, you know, they w- would like to work with other practices, practices as well. It's part of their ethos as they expand. They'd like to work with local practices wherever those kind of sites mm. are. So we've accepted that 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 will happen. And you know, we're working. We're approached by other people, who, you know, private landowners mainly who've got other sites where. You know they they see the benefit of an interim approach to the site. Um, so we're looking at a site in Woolwich, which we hopefully should get the planning letter today yeah. for. Um, so that will be a six-year interim use of the site. But then we're also looking at the long-term use of the site with a developer mm. as well. So they approached us with the interim use, and now we're we're looking at a scheme, of a big big mixed-use scheme for them. But the idea that we bring all of the interim stuff into the base of the building create a much more vibrant mixed use mm. building um that's great for the local economy <clears throat> so i think you know from from a business model that was really looking at these individual projects and maybe having some profit from those projects that can you know allow the practice to be a bit more research based sometimes yeah. it's actually leading to uh, you know a lot more work in terms of um i guess, I guess you know, developers and and councils and the GLA and other landowners, they see that 
they need to be talking to people that have got a entrepreneurial brain and yeah. that they can you know they can help write the brief and analyze what's going on in an area mm. and then work out you know it's, it's kind of how you how you work at college isn't it as yeah, an architect you kind of you know, find a site and then part of what we do as students is we're asked to really create a brief you know and that's i think we lose that when we get into practice mm. we're then spoon fed a site and a brief by somebody and we become kind of would you, would you that's why architects have become obsessed with aesthetics i think because we're very often excluded from all of those really important decisions about you know what what should actually what's the function of the site yeah. what's the what's the social value that we can add to an area and mm. um and that's really where lots of the architectural uh, the power of architectural thinking can really unlock the potential yeah. of the city is when we're able to kind of look and establish our own Definitely. our own brief or help empower the client to really yeah you know use the site in a way that they never thought possible and that is to look at the the function you know mm. often people come to us like you say with a very determined <clears throat> brief already and you're kind of like okay yeah. well then i can make it look nice and it kind of devalues what it is to 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 be an architect almost it does and i you know i think um yeah, that whole thing about, you know, being, you know, an, an sort of key uh, implicit within writing the whole brief or establishing the brief and understanding the site, you know, that's that's the, that's the skill set that architects have. And yeah. I think that's what we need to rediscover. And um, so, you know, I really think architects need to start becoming developers, basically, yeah. um, at small scale, but also at larger scale, or at least collaborating, collaborating yeah. and be more collaborative and so you know we're we're quite often now working with larger developers and we're 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 taking some of the risks so we might we might not be investing money but we say look we're confident that we can you know get this really great thing going on on the site so we'll take a really low fee and then we'll take a bigger fee than we'd normally get on if we're successful end, yeah. yeah so we'll take a success fee and again, you know, developers are very attuned to that because it's low, low risk for them. Yeah. Um, obviously, you can't do it all the time because, you know, you, you don't want to stretch yourself if things don't go right. But I think, yeah, architects need to take more risks. We need to be more entrepreneurial. And, you know, there's still a lot of wealthy architects out there from wealthy backgrounds. So put your money where your mouth is yeah. and, you know, start developing yourself. And then you can bring that social... Um, impetus that you that mm. you probably have to the site um, but I think also you know developers and people that um, think about buildings and, and bring buildings forward they they definitely they look at the bottom line possibly too much and they take too much advice from letting agents and estate agents and you know I guess, I guess a lot a lot of people we spoke to about Pop Brixton said it would never work because it was a back end of Brixton we mm. were going to charge too much rent and you know it just probably wasn't going to work and you know now everybody says on other sites oh well obviously it worked in Brixton <laughs> <laughs> but it will never work in Woolwich or somewhere else and um, but you know I think you you have to kind of build confidence and the good thing about containers is they're modular we can work out quite accurately what the unit cost of delivering one is yep. once you get out of the ground mm. Um, you know, it's it's. I think anywhere in Zone Two, Three, London, you know, you can pretty much charge a similar rent level because there's a shortage of space everywhere. Mm. And I believe that if you do, you know, if you create something of social value, people will want to visit it and they want to participate. And uh, you know, quite often those sort of those are those places that maybe 10 years ago people thought of as being undesirable actually now people quite want to go to those areas because you know they want to go somewhere that feels a bit more edgy and a bit, yeah. bit bit more undiscovered so yeah definitely who would have ever thought 10 years ago that we'd talking about peckham and brixton as places that cultural were, hubs of london yeah sort of that fact. were like happening places and um you know that people were flocking that people were choosing to live in those places yeah so yeah it's, it's been a, quite a transformation in in large areas of south london i think yeah and it's it's taken um a leap of faith often but i think by not trying to replicate what maybe works somewhere else you know um, where, where maybe you can get higher rents, but you know, if you if you're looking at uh, maybe areas of sort of social deprivation, then you have to provide what is kind of relevant to mm. those areas. 
So, so, so what, what advice would you give to like young practices or architects or people wanting to kind of particularly who have got that sort of sense of civic responsibility mm. uh, and then perhaps a kind of often stop themselves from engaging in that because oh, mm. it's, I, don't, I can't find the right developer to work with. How would you, what kind yeah. of advice would you give to people like if they want to take on these sorts of development projects, like how do you, how do you find the site? How do you, how do you begin the process? Well, I think local knowledge is, is always really important. Mm. So, you know, I tend to like to work in areas that I know really well because yeah. I kind of feel like I know what's going on. Um, but I think um, we were talking before about networking. Yeah. I think networking with bigger practices, for instance, if you're a smaller practice and they, they, they may often be working on big master plans mm. and... So there may be a bit of a site that could be fallow for a few years that, you know, if you go along and say, look, we've got a great idea for this. We know there's not enough crashes in the area. You know, maybe we can get some crowdfunding. My, my view is that I'd rather spend time working on real projects where I put my time in for free than I would wasting my time on open international competitions for glamorous art galleries that <laughs> I've got no chance of winning and the the whole profession's crazy to just kind of go along with this kind of like obsessive you know kind of competition thing we we could be spending all that time actually working pro bono for people that actually need help so that's yeah. things like uh, our little hackney city farm project which mm. is one shipping container we did that pro bono to help a local organ like social enterprise that we'd met um and they, they got the site, they got 7K funding, we suggested using a shipping container because it was really easy to self-build with. So that, that little nugget, that little thing that we did turned into Pop Brixton basically because yeah. for us what we got from it was that learning, you know, how much did it cost to convert a shipping container, how easy was it, you know. So there's always some value that you can extract from that. So I think, yeah, it doesn't, you not shouldn't probably start really big you should start really small and as we said earlier fail early fail cheap yeah. but hopefully succeed early succeed later <laughs> uh, but yeah you know definitely look for those small things that you can do and you know find people that need help and then figure out how you can help them and uh, maybe that means doing some commercial work so you mm. can afford to do the other stuff but i think that would be my advice and um yeah try try and find real projects Brilliant. And just to sort of finish up on, I'll kind of ask you a little bit about what you think the future of the profession is, like the future of, of the role of the architect and how how do you think we can kind of, you know, reclaim that, that place of leadership? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, well, I'm, I'm getting involved in lots of groups of architects and we're all networking and I, I believe in kind of open source approach yeah. where, you know, we're talking a lot about fees and sharing fee information and I've got involved with the RBA as well, so that's that's helping hopefully to spread the message. And um, you know, I think architects need to talk about business and business plans and all that mm. boring stuff, but it's the most important stuff really because yeah. it's yeah. it's the kind of you know the essential business backbone that allows you to do creative work. Um, so yeah, I think um, you know I'm pretty I'm pretty positive about the future for architects. It's really tough right now. I think. But I think, you know, architects have got that kind of tangential, um, entrepreneurial kind of thought process that they need. And maybe, maybe what architects lack a little bit is um, confidence that mm. they can take what they probably, you know, learned very well at university. And I think in a rapidly changing world where the construction industry is pretty slow to respond to most things, architects have, have, have that kind of training that means they can you know it's very ideas based and always thinking about innovation um so i think yeah thinking about how we can channel those that particular skill set that we've got is mm. really really important um but yeah i think definitely through leading through you know architects becoming more entrepreneurial and developer led as well um so not sitting back waiting for that traditional kind of client developer contractor role to establish itself yeah. you know to be more assertive and kind of create your own yeah yeah definitely um and i think also architects go into a lot of other industries um they become clients quite often mm. and that's great and I'd, I'd like probably like to see more architects moving into planning there's a real issue with planning at the moment without enough planning officers and it's it's a very uh you know kind of industry that's really under pressure and i think 
actually it would be great to see more architects yeah. step into into the world of planning and mm. actually if we could sort planning out that would really expedite lots of issues as well and I, I think there's a lack of understanding about design quality generally in, in planning so yeah there's there's lots of um, uh, I guess areas that are, are ripe for kind of people with architectural training to move into so I'm you know um, I'm, and there's you know, lots of places in the world that need architects to help them um, create better places and spaces, definitely. So, you know, I think we're beginning to look further afield as well and think about how we might work um, beyond the UK's borders mm. um, in bits of the world that need help. So, yeah. Wow. Um, well, where, where about you, whereabouts are you looking at at the moment? Or? Um, well, we've been thinking about um, uh, California, um, but also... Uh, Sweden in particular because they've got a big housing shortage in Sweden so yeah. we're about to start thinking about that but so one of the groups I'm involved with is London On which is just a sort of new collective um, of four or five practices mm. that have come together really post Brexit to try and uh, collectively go out and look for work as a, as a group mm. um, so we've been talking about maybe our first foray might be into some sort of uh, rundown areas of LA next year, but um, we're still trying to decide where the best place to to go might be. Could could end up being Sweden. Um, so yeah, we're we're working with the uh, Department for Industry and Trade as well. They help, they're advising us where we might might be best to actually start. But you know, again, it's not easy as small practices to go and start working in a totally new yeah place. yeah yeah exactly. But I'm you know talking to couple of people about projects in Spain at the moment so people are starting to sort of again through the whole kind of interim use thing you know yeah. so I think if you have you know a bit of a unique selling point it's a bit of a cliche but for us as a practice we we don't want to be pigeonholed and stick to one type of work but on the other hand you know being really expert in one thing mm. um, so for us shipping containers um, that's opening a lot of doors and doesn't necessarily mean it ends up being a shipping container project, but that conversation... It starts a conversation when you can is, kind of... Yeah, you, you know, so that, so that, yeah, that's that's that key that unlocks that door. But um, so, again, with with overseas projects as well, but more often than not, I don't come to anything, but, you know, then you make a contact and it's, it's that kind of... Um, yeah, so I think once you've raised your head above the parapet, then, you know... Hopefully, work comes to you a bit more. But mm. you know, we we are sort of as a collective, we're going to out going to go out and do some research, open a joint office, and do some uh, unpaid research work. Based, you know, we'll go and find some uh, local projects to do, yeah, and then we will publicise it. And you know, hopefully, by being on the ground, we'll make it happen. So again, that's about making that commitment to invest some money and some time mm. and hopefully have some fun while we're doing it and go and see what it's like to work in a different part of the world. So I'm really excited about that. Amazing. That's absolutely brilliant. Very inspiring talking to you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your time this afternoon. No, it's been a pleasure. Well, thanks. thanks. Bye. So that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. Today's podcast is sponsored by BQE Core, the award-winning platform that combines time and expense tracking, billing, project management, accounting, and business intelligence. Make work easy with Core. You can get a free trial at businessofarchitecture.co.uk forward slash demo. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.